uh, firstly we've got Dr. Jerome Saros. And uh, I'd like to uh, thank Jerome actually, because I mean, Jerome actually looks at it from a holistic point of view. So it's not just looking at mental health in isolation, it's looking at other things that are going on. Um, and so we're very excited about having him here to talk about how we can modify our life to perhaps improve our uh, mental health and our, and our wellness overall. So please welcome Dr. Joanne Saris. Thank you so much, Dr. Shaw. I'll have to first of all confess that uh, it's certainly been uh, an unhealthy week for myself. I've had to take care of a sick little girl for most of the week and my lifestyle's gone to hell, so I'm feeling quite <laughs> run down at the moment and very fatigued, so I'm really not the best person probably to be lecturing on this. So let's see if this works. You've got to get it within a five, a, let's do a five cent coin radius, otherwise. <laughs> oh, there, I an impressive that comes up. Okay, so I'm about to use my hand. So unhealthy lifestyle, well, first of all, and we can all be honest about it, I just told you about my week. How many here would say they've got a healthy lifestyle? A few, so probably 15%, some people in the middle. Okay, okay, so I think, uh, I guess probably the best way to approach this, we'll try to make this a very relaxed and, and enjoyable uh, session. I usually present a fair bit on data, but you guys don't want to see graphs and little dots and squiggles, I'm sure, so we'll have a little bit of fun with this. Um, and I guess to sort of encapsulate the essence of a uh, healthy lifestyle, and just to, I guess, have a bit of feedback, you can reflect on it and think about perhaps some areas of your own life. Uh, where you know where, where it is possible to improve and I guess what I love about it is that the field of uh, lifestyle modification is currently being known uh, or it's been touted as lifestyle medicine so when you see your practitioner uh, your clinician in a sense you could argue that you should be potentially receiving a prescription just as you would uh, a medication with lifestyle modifications so and I think it's very important because if we look at the disease burden in terms of uh, attributable deaths, you're looking at about two thirds of, of attributable deaths uh, related to non-communicable diseases. You know, and many of these are modif uh, modifiable. So in terms of uh, some of these risk factors, we're all aware of, I suppose, the biggies, uh, tobacco, uh, poor diet, physical inactivity, uh, being overweight and use of alcohol. And many of these particular, um, you know, naughties, if you like, things which we can modify, do have an impact on a range of health outcomes, uh, especially cardiovascular diseases and, in some cases, cancer. And generally, if you do see a physician, uh, they should hopefully, especially if you present with cardiovascular disease, uh, try to get you, if, if there is cases of overweight, to reduce weight, to look at you know, reducing tobacco consumption, you know, looking after sort of alcohol use, uh, not overusing, uh, but just regular dietary uh, advice such as limiting salt if you've got hypertension, you know, improving sort of use of, um, uh, I guess, sort of, you know, of a whole food diet, uh, reducing fats. But the funny thing is, there seems to be more evidence nowadays showing that some fats can be protective, and in fact, the whole cholesterol debate is, is garbage. And you remember years ago, People would say, oh, eat eggs, eat eggs, and oh no, don't eat eggs, it's got cholesterol. Oh no, now you can eat eggs, and now you don't know what to do. I mean, and probably the same, the same thing goes for chocolate. I mean, it's, uh, <coughs> so you have to live off air. That's really, be a breatharian. So. so one of the things that's more seriously we have, we have to look at is that many people with chronic mental illness do not engage in sufficient exercise. And we do know, which we'll talk about soon, the relationship between inactivity and mental uh, illness. Uh, and certainly an issue which we have to, I think, be aware of is uh, metabolic syndrome. And people who, have, who do have inactivity, in combination many times with their psychotropic medication, are at greater risk of having metabolic syndrome. And that can also impact cardiovascular disease, uh, reducing uh, life expectancy and, and general well-being. Um, so this can be defined as, I guess, a cluster of symptoms and presentations, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. And you'll probably be very familiar uh, with diabetes, type 1, type 2 diabetes. Well, you know, this is sort of a part of this particular uh, pernicious ne nexus, I guess, of these particular uh, symptoms. So one thing which everybody should be doing uh, is 
checking is. So certainly the older they get uh, in terms of some of these uh, particular uh, variables such as high blood pressure. So very important to get blood pressure checked occasionally. Uh, elevated blood glucose levels. Uh, abdominal obesity. So one of the issues is that do people carry their weight uh, around uh, the, their abdomen? So that's, that's a mark of four metabolic syndrome as well as elevated triglycerides uh, and uh, a lowering of what's known as the, the, the good fat, the HDL. So in terms of some of these particular protective factors, well we know the importance uh, you know, of, of various lifestyle modifications, but unfortunately you know, we are at the mercy to a certain degree of our genetics. But, that's some, but that being said, we don't have to be you know, completely worried about that because we still do have a range of elements which we can modify. And in terms of lifestyle medicine, uh, one of the, I guess, the areas which is growing with the recognition of its application is in the treatment uh, or, the, uh, or the use uh, in a prescriptive sense for people who have mental illness. And in my field, which I, I mainly sort of work with uh, uh, the area of depression and anxiety, uh, that really there is some, some quite encouraging evidence to show that various lifestyle modifications can improve mood, uh, can also improve overall well-being. Uh, and also, and I think this is, the, this is the big factor, is that when we improve our physical health, that will in turn improve our mental health. So I think that looking at lifestyle medicine, if you like, as something which should be considered a routine uh, a clinical prescriptive uh, element of you know, mainstream psychiatric practice is very important. With this particular review, we looked at a range of these lifestyle elements. Now, we'll talk a little bit about you know, diet and lifestyle, uh, diet and exercise soon. Um, but something which you may consider, what about pet therapy? How many people here have, have pets or animals? Yes, quite a, quite a few. And do we find that therapeutic? Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, that's right. So until, you know, unless, I mean, I love cats. They tend to jump on me all the time and they're... Yeah, they, they um, molt everywhere, so it's you know, not always that enjoyable. But um, uh, look, they, they really have a, a fantastic effect. So thinking outside the box, yes, we know sleep, we know exercise, diet, but there's all sorts of other elements. I mean, even looking at our connection with nature, which I'll talk about soon. Uh, what about the way we're spending, I, personally, I think, and I think that the data is going to show this, um, a, an excessive interface with technology and technology which is just co consuming us, you know, Facebook, and whatever, Instagram and... Tweet, tweeting, twittering. <laughs> uh, Virginia's banned me from from tweeting. She says, "Madrone, you can't, uh, you know, tweet because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, yes, you have to be very, very professional and watch what you say. If you're 140 characters, otherwise, you get in trouble." So, um, but I think it just consumes us, and that, and that is the issue. It's drawing us away from our natural existence, which we are all organic beings, you know, made of flesh and blood, and we are interacting with nature. But I think society is, is certainly progressively taking us away from that. Uh, and also vices. I think nowadays uh, that could also be considered for some people sugar. You know, the, the white devil, which they call it in the Orient, do they? No, it sounds good. Um, and, uh, well, I think they do. I think they call it the white, the white devils, which is fat, sugar, and white alcohol. Yeah, so these are the things to avoid. So there are a range of other aspects, I think, which we can consider. And this is easily, I guess, encapsulated in this just little uh, figure here, uh, chart. And you can see, yes, okay, our pharmacotherapy is synthetic or natural. Uh, for, a lot, for a lot of us, maybe the mainstay of our treatment. And employment is something which, for some people, you know, may be difficult depending on their circumstances. But the vast majority of these other elements are modifiable. We can have good nutrition. We can, within our you know, abilities, do some kind of physical activity. We can you know, at least do our best to set up good hygiene practices for our sleep, looking at limiting, uh, lim limiting our vices or taking care of substance or alcohol issues. Uh, I will also draw a fact to do with, uh, something to say to do with our, uh, caffeine use and anxiety disorders. I mean, it is surprising how many people with anxiety disorders have, you know, coffee, tea, energy drinks. And we know caffeine is an angiogenic, you know, and it, it also, can provoke panic and it, it inhibits sleep as well. And I've had uh, previously, I remember clinically years ago uh, when I used to practice, I uh, saw somebody and he uh, talk, was talking about caffeine. I said, oh, do you have 
you know, much caffeine. You know, this would be very anxious and so forth. And he said, oh, no, no, I don't have coffee. I said, well, uh, soft drinks, Coca-Cola. Oh, no, no, I'd never have anything like that. And I said, okay, what other drinks do you have? Oh, well, I'm English. I have about 12 cups of black tea a day. So um, he said, yeah, there might be a little bit of caffeine in that. So, um, so it's something to, to, I think, consider. Uh, community engagement. There's, there's really good data in terms of people uh, contributing to their community, having social networks, and doing altruistic activities in terms of uh, mental health. Green space and nature assisted activity, we'll talk about that soon. Uh, and which is you know, not near our cover today, uh, obviously so a psychological approach and, and something which we'll talk about this afternoon, which is mindfulness, can be a benefit. But we'll start off with diet and exercise. And um, as you can see, the guy on the right, that's one of the Bulgarian weightlifters uh, in the uh, Rio games. So in terms of what we can say, I guess, is a summary for uh, diet is that, yes, there is a link. Now we know, of course, there's a link between diet, quality, cardiovascular disease, no problem at all. Uh, even to do with sort of digestive diseases. Uh, and in some cases, cancer, different forms of cancer, in particular colon cancer. However, with mental health, it's only just recently been acknowledged because of this uh, Descartes model about you know the mind is separated from the body and oh how on earth can eating affect your brain? You know it's, they're, they're, they're too far apart. You know, <laughs> it's a traditional <laughs> medical view. But uh, we're starting to realise that oh actually they are connected. So um, what you you are is what you eat. It is true, and it, it is to the point also of your uh, brain chemistry as well because we require certain nutrients, macronutrients, micronutrients for adequate brain function. It makes sense. We need our amino acids, our, our vitamins, our minerals for this. Uh, and there's good evidence showing there's a link between dietary quality and lower levels of depression and anxiety for people who eat a whole food diet versus people who, who, who have a processed food diet, junk food diet if you like. One area which is very exciting and it's growing and growing and growing, uh, from a traditional medicine point of view we've always known this, but uh, science is, is thankfully catching up, and that is about the link to do with the microbiota, and I'll, I'll give a, a thanks to Georgie and Oliver for working on these slides as part of our Healthy Body, Healthy Mind program, she's generously donated them. So um, with the microbiota, uh, they are, I guess you'd say, well, to quote this famous Professor Charles Raison, they're our old friends. And I was saying, why is he saying they're old friends or old friends? This guy's weird, but you know, he got published in a very, very good journal, in the top psychiatric journal. But, so I guess they are our, our old friends. Um, and what's interesting about these particular uh, organisms, these microorganisms, they number over 10 times the amount of cells we have in our body. So in a sense, we can see that the microbiota, uh, or these microorganisms, essentially are the main creature, if you like, it could be a bit strange, and we are, you know, in a sense, they're hosting us. So it's, now I don't want to freak anybody out here, but um, <laughs> just remember they're our old friends, okay? So we're all, we're all, we're all friends here. Uh, but there's lots of different strains of these particular um, uh, you know, microbiota, um, uh, microorganistic uh, strains. Uh, and there's great diversity depending on a number of factors. And what's great about it is that we can modify these microbiota. So yes, okay, maybe they are hosting us, but we're feeding them. So uh, we exist in hopefully a very harmonious relationship. If we aren't in a harmonious relationship, then the evidence would suggest that it can affect our physical and mental health. Uh, because the ecosystem regarding microflora is very diverse and it impacts a great range of functions such as immunity, uh, such as gut motility, uh, a range of uh, oh, sorry, elements to do with uh, uh, yeah, um, uh, helping with fermenting food. So in that fer the fermentation of food has a, a range of flow-on effects in terms of the uh, inflammation cascade, uh, the, the actual integrity of the gut and I'll describe that a little bit more uh, in a second. So, uh, I think people have heard of the gut-brain axis, so <coughs> axis, maybe a little bit. Um, and let's, let's face it, when for many people they experience anxiety and chronic stress, one of the symptoms, certainly diagnostically and, and experientially, is you feel you know, digestive discomfort, pain, butterflies, nausea, uh, people may have stool dysfunctions as well, you know. 
and it's, it's relating to the innovation or the connection between uh, the brain uh, and the gut and also the fact that there's a range of neurotransmitters uh, which are involved in the process directly with the, the, the uh, digestive system, uh, in principle serotonin. So there is a strong link there. However, it works the other way around, bidirectionally, that uh, people who have poor gut function, they may have leaky gut, which sounds you know, quite you know, alternative, but the reality is it's, well, that's what I, you know, leaky gut, you know, what's that, leaking everywhere? And, <laughs> and but, 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 just to give you an idea, you've got your little villi, there's these little sort of, little kind of villi on the inside of the intestines, and they usually should be tight together, they form tight junctions, but when there's inflammation, uh, there is a little, the gap is sort of increasing and you can get some uh, particulates going through into the general bloodstream. That can set up inflammatory cascades, the inflammation can then go on and, and, and actually have it affect those inflammatory uh, markers which Gina talked about to go into the brain and affect uh, you know, a whole cascade of, uh, of neurological consequences. So the gut can directly, absolutely affect the brain. We got the buzzing. Do we have the buzzing there before? No, we the buzzing. Okay. It's the speaker. It's the speaker, is it? Is it me? No. Oh, it's that one. I was throwing something out of thing. Actually, sorry, it's been filmed, isn't it? Sorry, I forgot this is in film. Okay. Now I get the bill for the camera. Okay, so what's great about, as I said before, is that the diet is one of the key factors to modify the composition uh, of the, uh, of the uh, microflora. And this is important because you can get bacterial overgrowth or infestation. You know? And traditional medicine, one of the things we look at is changing the gut, uh, the, the gut microbiome uh, by using a traditional weed seed feed model. And I'd love to see it studied properly scientifically, and I'm sure that it probably will do one day. Um, using approaches to get rid of the, you know, the, I guess the, the, if there's bacterial infestation or if there's certain strains which aren't uh, health promoting in terms of uh, gut microflora and replacing them with, I guess, more beneficial strains. And you've probably heard of some of them such as acidophilus and bifidus. Yeah, so those sort of strains. Uh, what's great about it is that our diet, you know, can alter a fair percentage of the uh, microbiota variation and that the microbiota can change over the span of your life. So it's something which is modifiable. In terms of uh, probiotics for mood, so who here has taken a probiotic before? Do we know what a... Yes? Okay, so a lot of people. And, and a lot of the time for uh, things such as urinary tract, inf tract, tract infections, uh, IBS, thrush, sometimes uh, traveler's diarrhea, uh, after antibiotic use, very common. Um, and that sounds great, but what about the effect of, on mental health? Years ago, that would seem quite weird. What, you know, taking a, a, you know, a probiotic to improve your mood, it sounds weird. Um, the challenge we've got is that we really don't know what particular strains of these microbiota are going to have you know, a beneficial effect mentally. There are some animal studies which have shown you know, there is some link with decreased anxiety and depressive behaviours. Uh, I think really what we're looking at is probably prescribing something which has a wide range of known healthy uh, uh, microbiota. At the same time, it's probably not that each strain has an effect on, you know, on mood, on this disorder or that disorder. It's probably a sense of just improving the ecology of the bowel, reducing inflammation, uh, maybe you know, improving intestinal uh, integrity. And because of that, that will have flow-on effects in terms of the, um, you know, the, the brain and the neurological system. The other thing we can do, which is great, is that we can also look at improving our diet with prebiotics. Yeah. So our probiotics are the actual strains, you know, your acidophilus and bifidus. But in order for them to thrive and flourish, they need to be fed. They are fed off a lot of these wonderful fibrous foods. See? And what happens is they're broken down usually into short, fain, uh, short chain fatty acids uh, and they produce butyric acid and that feeds our wonderful healthy microbiota. 
So it's, in, it's important to realize that even just by adding some of these lovely fibrous vegetables uh, into our diet and legumes and berries, that they will have a flow on effect to improve uh, the uh, good bacteria. Uh, there's also probiotic foods, so where these particular supplements uh, have these derived from. Uh, yogurt, we've all heard of yogurt, and kefir, kefir yogurt is a good one as well. Sauerkraut, how many Germans here in the audience? A couple, yes, you, have your, you like your sauerkraut there? Yeah, no, no. <laughs> My father was Austrian and I can't stand it either, but I, you know, if I go out and have a schnitzel, I'll stomach a bit of it, you know, just because of this, you know, and I have my probiotic food. Um, now, if you're Asian, some Asian cultures, they like, uh, where is it here? Um, oh, it's not on there. Uh, kimchi. Yeah, kimchi. The, the, I mean, that stuff's disgusting, but anyway. Um, <laughs> nothing against our Asian fans. Really. But, uh, yeah, so I'm not really a good advocate. But some people love it. And kombucha tea as well. Natto, have you ever seen natto before? Iron Chef Natto, it's a, it's a sort of a very strange, you know the Iron Chef, the show? He's even there. They were always cooking natto. I don't know if I understood what this natto was, you know? So um, anyway, this is a fermented bean curd, and it's really quite a strange consistency. Um, I mean, I'm not really selling this very well, but um, just stick with yogurt. So, you know, so yeah, these are some, uh, some examples. So I'm not saying necessarily yes, let's just have, have supplements. I really think that food is, is ultimately the, uh, the, the best answer, but you can potentially combine all these. And funny enough, we're going to be doing a clinical trial soon to look at uh, different approaches in terms of dietary modification, prebiotics and probiotics on food. So if you hear that around the traps, you know, feel free to uh, join up the study. So next part, exercise. And welcome to America, or potentially Australia. And I hate to say it, but that would probably be me going down there as well. Because, yeah, you know you're going to be doing all this work in the gym, you know, you just get you in there. So, what, what we do know is that exercise really is a, a very, very potent antidepressant intervention. And it's been shown to be uh, in a very, very uh, famous study equivalent to Prozac in terms of uh, treating depression. Now I'm not saying that uh, SSRIs aren't important for certain conditions and the benefit, they absolutely are, but that's not to say that we can't also be looking uh, at using uh, exercise and physical activity on top of that. Um, and there's lots of different types of exercise. I'm not saying that everybody has to just get into that gym and start pumping weights, you know, over the brain here, or just, you know, running into the sunset, you know, at the top there. You know. um, what I am saying is that we can even do physical activities such as just getting out of the house, walking if we can, or at least doing some kind of, you know, mobility activity, walking in the park, or vigorously doing housework. You know, just something to get moving is very important. Uh, it also has some effects, depending on how it's done, to do with being mindful. So you can have types of mindful exercise, which can also um, deal with that. Now, usually it shows a dose-dependent effect. In other words, the more you do, the better you get out of it. You know, it's like everything in life, relationships. You know, the more you put in, the more you, you get out of it. You know, uh, so I get told all the time. Uh, but um, what I have uh, heard recently about is this very fascinating study showing that um, short bursts of exercise may be a benefit. So they looked at, I think, putting people on a, tre a treadmill or a bike, yeah, bike, exercise bike, and they did literally a minute warm up, and then they did 20 seconds of high burst activity as fast as they could, then a minute just kind of relaxing, then another 20, 20 seconds, sorry, not 20 minutes, 20 seconds, and another minute relaxing, 20 seconds. They did three lots of 20 seconds, and the outcomes uh, in terms of physical parameters. Uh, cardi uh, cardiovascular health and the lipids and blood sugar level were the same as the people exercising, you know, sort of day in, day out. So, you know, you've got your, what is it, your seven minute abs? Have you heard that? And there you go, there's like uh, 60 second abs or whatever. So, you know, you can, it just shows you, you know, you can do different types of exercise and you can get a decent effect from it. Green space. Um, one thing which I think has become increasingly obvious with our urbanised environment which is unfortunately just consuming us I guess uh, the, the, you know, the modernity of uh, today uh, is that we have less exposure to uh, nature uh, and that's yeah our modernity is, is, is absolutely uh, you know I think part of that and 
if you look at some of the data, it's very interesting to show the relationship between people who live in more uh, nature-based environments rather than over-urbanisation, and they have all sorts of improvements or, or, or I guess, uh, uh, increased um, how you say, levels of well-being uh, and all sorts of other effects. Uh, even, for example, I remember seeing a brain study where people who were brought up in the country and you've probably heard of the amygdala, you know, the little amygdala, and it lights up when you know people panic and anxiety. That people who are living in the country, compared to people who were living in the city, this the city people, their little amygdala was lighting up when they were brain scanning it, when they were showing them all this anxious imagery. The people in the country, the amygdala was, was you know, not not much was happening. Now I'm saying there's more to it than that, obviously, but it's very interesting to show there are brain differences and how we respond to stress determining with our, uh, our environment and obviously there's many reasons psychosocially beyond just nature but it is interesting. Uh, there's a Japanese type of forest bathing called, what is it, Ryujuku? I don't know, my Japanese is terrible. We went over there a little while ago and it was absolutely embarrassing, I was trying to pronounce these names, but it's a really fascinating uh, traditional art where people will actually go into the forests as therapy you know you get all the oxygen you get the exposure to green colors which affect the brain all that um, you know fantastic natural environment and also your microbiota your microflora will change if you have more exposure to nature yeah and there's actually one study which showed that rugby players had a very diverse bowel flora yeah based on their exposure to grass because they were just constantly in dirt and grass you know, so. <laughs> Go out and play rugby. That's um, right. Not suggesting that, but other benefits. Uh, I think is that really there's minimal side effects of going out in nature, assuming you don't get eaten by a bear. I mean, you're generally you're doing okay. Um, vitamin D exposure. There is certainly a link to do with vitamin D levels and mental health. Now we have to be, of course, careful of skin cancer, but then I'd argue it's going the other way that people are avoiding sun. It's having an effect not only on vitamin D, but I think that's a proxy marker potentially for other neurological effects of being out in sunshine. Because, you know, I know myself, if I'm around sunshine, you feel, I mean, you feel fantastic. And in Melbourne, the weather's been shocking. It's been grey and miserable. It just, it, it just, yeah, it does have an effect on your mood. Also, linking this to socialisation, I think, has an additive effect. You can do group activities or exercise. Uh, and also, you know, it gives you a variety of options in terms of the type of exercise you want to do. So one thing which we do get asked a lot clinically is, well, it's great, this exercise is fantastic, but how do I do it or how do I get my patients to do it? And I think one of the key things I've seen, certainly my, you know, years ago, one of my first qualifications I did was as an exercise instructor, and the key thing is getting people motivated. That's a big challenge. And I've found that a very simple thing to think about is to not put pressure on ourselves. One of the biggest issues, people put too much pressure, and that's why I like that you know, 20 second exercise thing. It's like, hey, great. Half the battle is getting there, is getting to the pool, getting to the gym, going for a walk. And I've found that little cues are very helpful, such as to create momentum and inertia, so to break you know, inertia. So to put, say, the, you know, your, your, your shoes, jogging shoes by the door, get into gym gear, have a cup of green tea or something, um, set aside some time. So have these cues to be able to do it and then take the pressure off yourself. So look, I only have to just turn up and do X, Y, Z. Don't have to do too much. And then what you find is you end up doing all the time more than what you thought you'd do. So it's a matter, I think, of dealing with expectations. Afterwards, you can also put in uh, a reward as a cue. I think can be quite, uh, as a, as a um, motivation uh, um, key. Uh, the other thing you can do I think it's important is for structure and consistency uh, to, to, to take place as well. So that's that, that's very important. Uh, this, but um, mindfulness is covered next. So it's something to reflect on. Are we mindful or are we mindful? And in many ways, we obviously have uh, you know a, a very very you know cluttered mind. And that, I won't go into that too much, except to say that mindfulness can be linked into our exercise and even our eating habits as well <coughs> and there's lots of benefits so I'll just finish up with the next five minutes talking about 
uh, biophilia and, and, and some of the interesting things to do with uh, what's known as blue zones and different types of diets. So, not to harp on about it too much, but we do have an inherent relationship with nature and it's an important one that we need, I think, to feel healthy and to feel, uh, I guess, sort of, yeah, well and prosperous and, and so forth. And we know there's a, a fantastic connection which has been just you know, detailed through the through nature in terms of pe uh, throughout history, in terms of people using nature, whether it be public parks or Hippocrates, I think, uh, advocated you know about healing in nature. Uh, Roman hospitals had uh, were set up in nature, and they had they don't even know if they had roofs. They were sort of was open, and people would literally be in their hospital, you know, immersed in nature. And we know that there is really profound link uh, between uh, you know, exposure to nature, less urbanisation, uh, and that if this is combined with exercise, known as green exercise, uh, that we do get a range of additional benefits beyond just exercising. So it's something to think about. So finishing up with blue zones, what are blue zones? Anybody know? Well, we'll tell you now. So, blue zones uh, are these particular areas or pockets which have been studied of areas where people have very much marked increased longevity. So, places where lifestyles are, are, are directly related to people living longer, and that this is a part, I guess, innately of the culture uh, germane to this particular region. So, as you can see, here's an example of these blue zone hotspots. Uh, you know, all around the world there, and you can see uh, the life lessons. Move naturally, you know, have your right tribe, or at least have that social connection and support, have a, a positive outlook. A lot of time that's tied into to spirituality, or at least some sense of purpose in life, uh, and, and also about eating wisely. You can see there's some of the, uh, some of the areas, and all these areas have it should be said slightly different diets, but they do have those key aspects which I just talked about. Uh, Okinawa is an example. Uh, previously they were living over 100 years of age. I mean, the data is a little bit disputed on this. Um, recently, unfortunately, the, you know, with the advent of uh, you know, a lot of, sort of fast food and so forth for some of the younger generations, they're not doing as well, uh, but they have absolutely fantastic uh, longevity uh, for their particular culture. And they eat a range of, of dietary uh, products. Uh, you know, two of the areas, a lot of seaweed, tofu, miso, and we talked about that in terms of the microflora, you know, in helping out with being uh, a probiotic food, so it's something which is interesting. And really, they're, they're not overeating. They have lowish saturated fats and carbohydrates, low calories uh, with their diet. They eat a fair bit of sweet potato. And this is uh, Toguchi. How does he look happy? He's relaxed and he's 102. And you know they, they have very low stress, and I know this is not completely com comparable to what we do, but you know I think there is a lesson for us all sometimes in terms of simplifying things. A carrier in Greece, it's uh, their uh, longevity is contributed to a few things. They eat mainly this Mediterranean diet, and I'd encourage you if you don't already to, you know, to adopt some of these principles in terms of olive oil, garlic. Potentially a little bit of red wine if that's if that's you know not too bad for you. Fish and seafood, which is very high in omega threes. Yeah, they've got a strong sense of uh, social work. M mineral springs, I think it's quite interesting, and and even saunas. There's some good data coming out in terms of people doing saunas or steams, and a hypothermic effect on the body can actually have a, a range of beneficial immune uh, effects and, and neurological effects. Uh, but these people really are uh, attached to nature and, and they, and they uh, live in such a way. Costa Rica, in the Nicoya region, this is a comparative study looking at the Nicoya region compared to others, and they had a higher life expectancy uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, significantly obviously lower uh, death rates. So probably with these particular cultures they do eat a lot more beans and legumes, rice, they do have some animal proteins. I think what's interesting about um, you know, their diet, if you look at it, I mean, does that look like, is that what you normally have to eat? No? No, I don't have anything like that. In fact, I had a radish on my breakfast this morning and my daughter threw it at me and said, Daddy, you need to eat this. And I said, I'm not eating that, get that away from me. So, that's, I'm not a very good advocate for the uh, use of the, uh, 
in the Koi at lunch. But um, I think we can certainly increase a lot of this, uh, certainly the legumes and, and, uh, and leafy vegetables and, and fruits. And this is Humberto Angula. So he's playing, I don't know what he's playing there, some kind of... Yeah, no, croquet, yeah, croquet. Um, so they have a really good sense of socialization, strong sense of community and, and, and support uh, within that. They're outdoors, they're amongst nature, they're, they're doing things physically, and that has a fantastic effect on their longevity, uh, as well as, no doubt, their mental health. So finishing up last slide here, uh, this has been, well, some of the elements encapsulated in our program called the Healthy Body, Healthy Mind Day Program, which uh, Gina Oliver uh, is uh, looking after in terms of some of the research assessment, and that's at the Melbourne Clinic, and it's quite an exciting program. We've developed it over the space of a few years. It's 12 weeks of an integrative lifestyle model uh, con containing five different uh, elements. We've got our exercise theory and practice, diet and nutrition, we even do cooking skills, so it's very practical. Uh, lifestyle educa uh, psychoeducation, motivation and goal settings, which obviously is very critical, and also there's a mindfulness element to try to have a holistic, integrated approach uh, to improving people's lifestyle. And yeah, if you're interested, just uh, touch base with us at the Melbourne Clinic. And so finally, I guess I'd like to say, have, just have a little bit of a ponder. There's nothing, you know, we don't have to be perfect with our lifestyle. It is very challenging. We've all got our individual challenges and constraints. However, even if we just tweak things a little bit here and there, take a look at it, see what sort of benefits you can get. It's not a matter of doing everything all at once necessarily, but bit by bit, you know, if we do sort of tweak our lifestyle, uh, there is certainly the promise that it can improve our overall physical health and overall mental health, and that will also have a flow-on effect uh, in terms of uh, helping with psychiatric disorders as well. Thank you. No idea how long that was. Is there any questions for Jerome? No? No, excellent. Oh, um, I think you spoke a little while ago, a few years ago, about Carver. Yes, Carver, yes, yes. Yeah. yes. Part any of the advances? Fijian lifestyle. Yeah, any yes. advances on it? Like Yes, so um, the question was about carver, and, and, and I think the last time we talked about it in connection with anxiety disorders. Yes, so carver is a South Pacific plant medicine, and it's been it's used uh, recreationally to improve mood and reduce anxiety, but we're using it uh, in our clinical trials, and people use it uh, in practice uh, in tablet form. Uh, for disorders such as generalised anxiety disorder, muscle pain, sometimes it helps with sleep, uh, may also improve mood if people have some depression with their anxiety. So we're conducting at the moment through uh, Melbourne University, but the, the study is based, the trial site at uh, Swinburne in, in Hawthorne, and we've got another trial site in Brisbane, the UQ, uh, and it's a 16 or 18 week study uh, testing CARVA, uh, one group will get CARVA, the other group placebo, so it's a proper double-blind randomised controlled trial. And in terms of the feedback about it, well, our last two clinical trials, I don't know when I last talked, it might have been prior to the, our last results coming out, I'm not too sure, but we've had two clinical trials in a row which have shown that the CARVA has significantly decreased people's anxiety compared to placebo. So I think it certainly is a, a very valid option. Speak to your practitioners in terms of whether, whether it's right for you in the context of other medications. And all sorts of advice, people don't combine with alcohol, benzos, and that because it may affect the liver in rare people, in rare occasions, to have a, a good baseline liver function, uh, as well as potentially to check the liver function every so often. But it certainly can be a, a you know, very, uh, appropriate treatment for people, a good evidence-based plant medicine treatment to reduce anxiety. Yeah. Uh, yes, up the back. What sort of quantity? Well, the active constituents known as carbolactones, and you're looking at, say, each tablet will contain about 50 or 60 milligrams of carbolactones. So the average uh, general dose is about two tablets twice a day. Um, so about 100 to 120 milligrams of carbolactones twice a day. Some people may use it uh, more episodically in terms of if they've got an anxiety, uh, at a time where they're feeling anxious or there's, they're leading up to an anxious or an anxiogenic effect, uh, event, but they may take it for a few days before and then they'll stop taking it. So you don't have to take it all the time, 
In fact, this is what the study's looking at to see should we be using it chronically or you know, should it be used as needed? Because it, you will get an effect after about an hour, hour and a half usually. Uh, and yeah, so it is something which doesn't necessarily have to take a long time to take effect like an SSRO. And something, something else. What the, what was it, something? No. Somebody was just stretching, yawning. Sure. Yeah. If you want them, I mean, I'm giving them away for free. Just please, so, <laughs> uh, they're uh, worth anything. But yeah, sure. Uh, happy to do that. Just uh, I think I've got my, what my email on the front there, or I don't know. I'll just. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, slides on me. Let's. Uh, <laughs> give them away. Thank you. Thank you.